What's up, Believe Nation? Welcome to season three of Million Dollar Businesses, where I break down what it takes to build a million dollar plus business in different industries. This season, we look at the life coaching industry where I sit down with Tim's story and we go over his 10 keys to success to building a lucrative life coaching business. Tim has traveled to 75 countries to counsel high profile leaders, entrepreneurs, artists, and athletes. He's authored multiple best-selling books. He's been a featured guest on Oprah's Super Soul Sunday. If you want to learn how to be a successful life coach, this is the man you want to learn from. Let's go meet him and pick his brain together. When you're talking about life coach, whoa, or life advisor, you're taking somebody's life in your hands. And so I think it's very, very important to become educated in what it means to coach somebody in their life. Be careful, man, you got people's lives in your hands. So I, I literally keep my phone on 24 hours uh, a day because, you know, I've had, I've had 13 people die on me in the last year. They died. So it's no joke to me, but this is all real stuff. So it's not like, oh man, I'm a coach. I'm out there making money. No, people are dying. So we've saved a lot of lives and we lost lives so it's serious stuff mr tim story thanks for having me in your home man really appreciate it good to see you i'm loving what you're wearing this is it this is fresh but what's the logo all about the logo well this is about, about you but i'll quickly tell you the logo the logo is a paper airplane yeah to me it represents entrepreneurship so entrepreneurs we take off Ooh. right so we got we, we have a dream we want to fly we want to like take it. off but but it's a paper airplane because we don't have the money the resources our, the, the wings are hitting. We're not this jet plane taking off right away, but we we're, we want to be. I like it. Right? It's working. Yeah. So so instead of doing a fist pump, what I do is we do this. We do this. Believe it's the airplane taking off. Boom. There, there it is. I like it. See. <laughs> I love it. So we're doing a ten part series to talk about how to have a success uh, in the life coaching business. Mm -hmm. Point number one for you was get educated. Yes. So what does that mean to you? Well, I think that you know before you get out there and share your knowledge you, you got to get knowledge right <laughs> and, I, and, I, and i think that i always say it this way just because you can sing doesn't mean that you should be a professional singer okay so just because you're smart doesn't mean you should be a life coach because when you talk about life coach whoa or life advisor you're taking somebody's life in your hands and so i think it's very very important to become educated in what it means to coach somebody in their life. So my my background is I have a doctorate in world religion, but while I was studying that, I took probably seven years of training in uh, marriage and family, crisis counseling. So really I, I am a therapist. Mm. So that, that helped me to deal with people's lives. Cause as you know, you got your physical life, your spiritual life, your financial life, your job, then you have your, uh, uh, social life so depending on what somebody is going through I feel like because of my education I'm more equipped to handle whatever they're going through so what do you think somebody who wants to be a life coach should do for their own education how do okay. we get educated as a life coach? okay so one thing is your story is your story so I, I do believe that somebody can have a, an amazing story of coming from addiction and then getting better and then they can coach people in, in that field or someone that was a, an athlete and they went from being an athlete and and then they no more applause of the crowd they could coach somebody having to do with that but I think it's it's very important that you really really have a true revelation mm -hmm. of what you're talking about so a revelation brings conviction so you have to have a revelation on that on that subject so my type of uh, life coaching a lot is in the area of crisis. So I have my own story. Father dies at 10. Uh, that was difficult on my, my, my mother, raising uh, four children. We have five, but one had already been married. Four children on her own. So that was my story, right? But then I wanted to get a revelation on crisis coaching on how to bring somebody through their dilemma. So you have your story, but then get educated in the area that you want to help people in. 
Do you still coach people beyond the crisis or are you the crisis management guy? Well, I started as a crisis guy and then now my last book was called Come Back and Beyond. Mm -hmm. but, but I'm super good at the crisis. And the thing that I realized, Evan, is that people are going through something always. And I, I say that you're going through recovery and discovery at all times. So recovery is, you know, healing from wounds of our past. But so I was just like healing you of the wounds in the past. So now I'm also the, the discovery coach too. So yes, I deal with crisis, but also deal with the beyond now. But that, that's something that I kind of grew into. Are there any good programs or courses or like, if I want to be a life coach, you can't just go to university and become a life coach. There's some phenomenal ones. Okay. I mean, I love John Maxwell. I think that John Maxwell's coach coaching system is, is, is one of the best. So there's probably about like five amazing uh, coaching programs. Um, I would have probably taken John's to add to mine if I needed it. But for me, uh, I was fortunate because, as you know, I work with entertainers. So what would happen is that if, if I was not educated in an area, uh, there was a there was a go to psychologist that's very well known that taught at USC forever. And we I would go to her for the, the some answers and then we created a curriculum. And then I added two more psychologists and one psychiatrist, and we created a 550 page curriculum on coaching that's phenomenal. Yeah. But without the revelation, the training won't help? Well, the training will help, but you gotta know that you gotta know you gotta know. You gotta, you know, it's, it's almost like Michael Jordan, right? He had a revelation that he was so good at being Michael Jordan he, he'd stick his tongue out. You put one defender, two defenders, three defenders. Doesn't matter. Bam, 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 bam. Same thing. If somebody comes to me in a crisis, I don't think I can be beat. Uh, I'm good. I'm good at untying a knot. Like when you were a kid, did you ever get a knot in your shoe? Yeah, I still do. Okay, okay. <laughs> so for some reason, my mother was really good at untying knots. I'm like a master at untying knots. And is that a combination of you just having to untie so many knots in your own life plus then learning the skills or it's, it's just a talent? No, I think it's, I think it's really more of understanding the skill, the skill of how to work through a crisis. Like how do I work through this crisis? And so, you know, one of the ways you work through a crisis, number one is you have to become awake. And then number two, you got to take inventory. Mm -hmm. So I'm awake. Now I take inventory. Oh crap. What do I, what did I do to myself? And then thirdly, you got to look for help. People stronger than yourself, okay? And then the, 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 the fourth thing you got to do is you got to cooperate with your comeback. Hmm. So just those principles alone, we've untied the knots of some of the greatest minds in the world. Hmm. Do you then teach people how to use your system? Yes, yes. So I would say of the 20 best life coaches in the world, I probably coach probably 12 to 14 of them yeah that's my deal i like it yeah. and is it a training system that anybody can sign up for or is it is it public and they find it well i think it's just they look for me right and uh at this stage of my life i'm like a player coach you know i'm in my 50s and i feel like i'm a player coach so i only have so much time in the day to do the one-on-one -on -one counseling that i do and so now i don't want to do like the mass counseling but there are great coaches that I coach nowadays mm. and really teach them this system from this over 500 pages that we have uh, created with the psychologists and psychiatrists. But you know, the, the cool thing is it's changing people's lives. That's what it all comes down to. That's what you do, that's what I do. Mm. Does the revelation come from a pain? The revelation can come from the pain, but the revelation is, is a, an illumination it's the Oprah aha moment, hmm. okay? So the revelation can come from deep, deep study and then you go, bam, I get it. But you do have to have empathy and compassion to understand pain. So I've been through personal pain, but I also have compassion to understand pain. Hmm. So if I'm, if somebody watching this, yeah, they feel like life coaching is for them, 
they're not 100% sure what the next step is or how to get the best education, what would you say is my next three steps I need to go off and start doing? Okay, number one, you have to see what moves you. I'm moved by people hurting. Mm. So I remember I was running laps when I was a kid, probably fifth grade, and there was a, a kid named Freddie who he was having an asthma attack in the middle of these laps we were running. And me and this guy named Don, we used to try to be number one and two. We'd switch off and who was the best. And I was beating Don this day. But I saw Freddie have an asthma attack and I stopped winning to make sure Freddie was okay mm. and, and told the teacher so we can get his inhaler. Mm. So, so I was moved. So number one, you gotta be moved. Number two, find a mentor. So number one, be moved. What moves you? Number two, get a mentor, okay? And then number three, just open your lives to helping someone. It's not usually like online coaching at first, or you like get your own office space. Just start being open to help give somebody else a boost. On the mentorship side, how do you do that? If somebody comes and says, hey, Tim, will you mentor me? I want to be a life coach. I'm sure there's tons of people who would want that opportunity and your time is yes. super limited. How do you pick who you'd want to mentor? Okay, on the mentor side, you just opened up the door because you just came in my house and we're doing these courses to help them learn. Mm -hmm. so, so that's good on you. Thanks for doing this. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. No, that's what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. So we're, we're not charging them right now. So, so they are being mentored by somebody who's a master at what I do. So there's their answer right there. And, and there's Follow books you. and... <laughs> <laughs> so, so there's books and podcasts and you've done lots of other videos and interviews. Yes. But then the, the actual, hey, Tim, I'm dealing with this client. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to help them. Yeah. They're so there, struggling. There, there's good manuals out there yeah. on, on coaching, how to coach, okay? There's a great podcast that you know some of us have been on and we're sharing secrets mm -hmm. and and then you know I'm I'm a pretty open guy so if they can find me I always try to like pay it forward and what do you need to see from a mentee because I think most mentees yeah here's the thing I think mentors love giving back yeah I do it's the greatest it's the greatest thing of all time but you hate wasting your time yeah and so so many mentees never follow through that it's hard to make that I'm balance. Look, I'm looking for heart. Yeah. I'm looking for heart. Like if somebody cares about people, if they're helping somebody like in the addiction space, like I help a lot of people in the addiction space. Mm. And so if I see somebody that is trying to help somebody, man, I'm there. I, I want to help you because you may help stop a young man from overdosing on heroin. Mm. So it's worth my time. And would you say it's better to have somebody come in and say, hey, Tim, will you be my mentor? Or hey, Tim... I'm struggling with this one question. I think it's both. Okay. I think it's both. I think, you know, as you just said, time is a factor for you and me, right? Mm -hmm. And so sometimes it's like, hey, take a drive with me to Starbucks while we talk. Sometimes it's, you know, let's do a Skype meeting or a Zoom meeting. Or sometimes it's like, hey, read this book. That book helped me. Or watch that podcast. That podcast helped me. Got it. And then back to just education and getting enough qualifications and feeling like you're ready. What about the people who feel like they're never ready? That they'll look at you and say, well, I'm not Tim's story level. Yeah. I can't do that. So you, you share from the position that you are presently. Mm. Like there's some really good coaches that are like 20 years of age. They're not like 42, but they're 20. So share from where you are presently, but realize, be careful, man. You got people's lives in your hands. So I, I literally keep my phone on 24 hours uh, a day because, you know, I've had, I've had 13 people die on me in the last year. They died. Wow. So it's no joke to me. Yeah. Yeah, they died. So, I mean, that's very sober, right? But this is all real stuff. So it's not like, oh, man, I'm a coach. I'm out there making money. No, people are dying. So we've saved a lot of lives and we lost lives. So it's serious stuff. How do you deal with the weight of that? Of like, this is Man, actually life and death. The, the weight of like somebody passing is, is heavy stuff. It, it really is. I mean, like, um, 
there's a group I, I work with called Melrose Recovery. And, um, you, you know, you see a, a young guy or young woman come in and they're just not themselves. And maybe they're there two, three weeks and it looks like they're gonna make it. They're like, Tim, I'm gonna make it. Oh my God, your stuff is working. And then, you know, sometimes these people will leave and you hear four months later that they OD'd in a hotel room. It's, 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 it's really, really, really tough stuff. It's tough stuff. But to me, it, it makes me want to get better, mm -hmm. better at understanding better at giving answers right you know it do comes, you feel the burden of that like it's, i totally do how do you not feel i'm their life coach they died it's my fault how do you yeah. get over that well I, I i don't i don't think that there is a, a way to like dust it off like it was a bad a bad game right. like if you're an athlete i'm feeling the weight just no sitting man here. i carry it yeah i carry it i carry it i i just went to a funeral today you know so um this is all real to me but I think that that's why, even if I'm dealing with a, a famous actor, that they may not be in a crisis like they're gonna die. But I, I do believe that the pain that I carry from other people makes me good at all levels. Mm. Man, it's so important. You, like you, you, you gotta carry the pain. I like it. Uh, since this video is about getting educated, what last tip would you have for people who want to be a life coach that you feel they're missing in their education path? I think look for mentors, as you brought up earlier, of people that are that are good coaches. I think Brene Brown is phenomenal mm. she, as as a writer of uh, you know daring bravely and and getting through some of the pain of your past. Uh, my good friend, she's my friend too. Also, Yonla Van Zant and and what she's done about getting through pain. Um, my stuff, my book, Utmost Living, Don't Get Stuck in an Almost Life, my book, Come Back and Beyond. I think it's, you know, I think that's a group of people that actually really care. So you're going you're gonna to feel that from our writings and also from what we say in interviews. This is part two. Today we're talking about how to be original. Tim, what do you got for us? Number one, thanks for doing this. It's, it's really helping people, right? I hope so, man. That's the goal. So there's a saying that says, uh, you were born an original, don't die a copy. I like that. But, but nobody knows who came up with it. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so to, to be original is unique, one of a kind. So I think that even in coaching, mm -hmm. we can learn from other coaches from the past because coaching has been around a long time. But I also think that you need to be original and a lot of that is based on what your life story is. Okay. So how, who have you learned from in the past that impacted you the most, just as a starting point? Okay, so my life story is, you know, lower income, struggling, seven people in a two bedroom apartment. So I really tend to lean towards the struggler, okay? So this is a funny thing. Someone gave me a book about the life of Mother Teresa. Okay. So when I was in high school, junior in high school, I started to read about Mother Teresa. I read one book, then read another book, and then I started studying different articles about Mother Teresa on how she had a heart for the orphans. Mm -hmm. And so I learned how she was mentoring orphans. So really my original mentor how cool is this, is Mother Teresa. That's wild. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, she loved the underdog. Okay, so have you met, did you meet her? I never met her, no. Okay. I never met her, but you know, I studied where her, where her house uh, was, how she, how she learned, who her, her mentors were, the sacrifice that she made. And um, so I, I learned from her successes and challenges. And you've heard this before. Uh, success leaves clues mm -hmm. and so I saw that she was was caring she was compassionate but she also really learned how to take people and and put them into a program so they can get out of their situation so amazing if mother tree says that's such a wild uh yeah as a mentor as a life coach for a I love kid it. for a kid from compton i love it it's great <laughs> so so mother Teresa is your mentor yes you're gonna learn from her from the books and documentaries and things that have been written about her because she, she didn't have a youtube channel to watch her videos exactly 
Now, how do you take what she did and say, okay, I'm gonna apply that to life coaching and be an original? Okay, so, so here's what we got. So the original side of Mother Teresa is that she was a, a school teacher and she was going in to, to teach one day and you know, she's a nun. And she noticed that the same orphans were outside the school day after day. And she started thinking to herself, I need to do something about these orphans. So she started to, to educate the orphans just on the streets. And then she said, I got to take this even deeper. And she, she found a, a place for just a few orphans to actually live. Well, more and more orphans started finding out about it. And so now they begin to gather. Mm. So she was educating them, housing them, educating them, housing them. It's powerful, right? Mm -hmm. So then she came to her superior and said, I think that this is my calling. Mm. So that was her original thing. And that was Mother Teresa being original. So her compassion was real. Her love was real. And then the fact that she knew she, I had to educate them and I need to feed them. So with Tim's story being uh, an original in what I do, I, I took it from my, Mother Teresa. I need to educate people and I need to feed them, not not food. I need to feed them the right information mm -hmm. so they can rise up. So very, very similar, compassion and food. And I'm feeding you material to help you rise up. That's what I do. I love it, man. That's wild. I got to yeah. process that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so how do you get, for people watching, they want to be a life coach, you're trying yes. to figure out how can they be original what would you recommend as a, as a starting point or process? I think it's very important to, to look at your, at your past. Like what were your interests when you, when you were little? And so what my interest when I, when I was little was, you know, I love sports, but I also really always had compassion for people. So early on in my life coaching, I used a lot of sports metaphors okay <laughs> so i'm known for this i could be like telling a, a powerful beverly hills woman she'll go like so what do i do the fool left me after 20 years i go you got to just hit singles and she goes what's that have to do with anything <laughs> i go yeah because most people they try to hit home runs but just hit a single hit another single hit another single hit another single and you'll build your confidence so it's really a crack up that sports metaphors even the Beverly Hills women actually work. <laughs> do you know where the out of left field comes from? Uh, I do not, and, but I love to study all those things. Whenever there's a saying that I don't understand, I, I like to, to find that out. So it, it's probably like out of, from out of nowhere. Like it wasn't expected. Right, but why, why it's a baseball analogy, I'm assuming, because it's left field. Yes. But why that? Yeah, I think it could have been out of right field, but the person just thought of left field. <laughs> so it just means... it will have to look it up. It, it means from out of nowhere. Yeah, no, uh, yeah. I just was curious as to why yeah. like I get the singles in the home run. But runs. isn't that wild? So, so me being an original was I took the fact that I was, I was born lower income, and then so I have compassion for people. Uh, I was in a cramped environment, so I don't want to be cramped, and I don't want you to be cramped. And then I love sports, so I started using those metaphors. So to, to be an original in your coaching, because that's what we're teaching, um, lean on your past. And if you love deep sea fishing, use those as some metaphors. Uh, some of these guys that have been captains in, in, uh, of ships, they use that, right? Or uh, take a Lewis Howes, he was a, a professional football player, he uses a lot of the, those things. So. Whatever your past is, take from your past and use it in your coaching. That requires courage. Yes. To be an original. It does. To say, I'm gonna be a life coach based off of Mother Teresa's philosophy of feeding people. Right. Is a wild concept that to lean in on it and to succeed with it requires courage. Yes, so it depends on how good you wanna be at being a coach. Because if you just mimic somebody you're gonna be like a, a karaoke coach. <laughs> you got a pound right there, buddy. <laughs> I was thinking Elvis impersonator, but that was same good, thing. man. <laughs> a karaoke coach. There's too many karaoke <laughs> coaches out there. Does that make sense? I'm a hundred percent. Look, they're just like reading. It's, it's not even a sports analogy. It's, it's, it's just you're going reading off. and coaching. Yeah. I'm not a karaoke coach, yo. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. 
says because I'm, I'm i'm bringing my stuff i'm bringing the fact that man I, I i have been through pain so i just met with probably one of the most famous men in the whole world and so i came in and he goes you don't have any notes on you like he thought i was gonna walk in he, seriously he's one of the most famous men in the whole world i i didn't come in with a big binder i came in with me i just started dropping bombs on the guy just saw his life just start changing like in 30 minutes why because i'm original i'm dropping my life story i'm dropping my education i'm dropping what i learned it's like jay-z he's not nervous to get up there and, and rhyme because he's not a, he's not a karaoke jay-z he is jay-z <laughs> jo joker J. I don't know you gotta no i love that this is good right but, but it still requires confidence like courage to go and do the thing and, and am I good enough that my story will move people? Yes. So practice. Mm -hmm. So 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 practice. Like, okay. When you're going into a convenience store, someone's going to be there begging. Okay. Coach them. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You have friends. Coach them. See what's hit. See what's missed. See what's working. See what's not working. Yeah. Like I'm coaching people every day if you went with me to the airport okay i gotta go somewhere on wednesday you will see from the minute i walk through lax to the time i get on the plane someone's gonna say hey tim story right from the beginning the guys that handle bags yo what's up tim tim hey just a second i got the situation with my girlfriend boom 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 right. boom because i've been rolling through there for 25 years so they know what i do they know who i am they they're always asking me hey tim story I cannot go to a restroom on any airplane. I mean, any airplane. If I get up and walk to the back, somebody grabs me. Right. It's a true story. Hey, Tim, story. So you can coach everywhere. Practice. But you're saying even if they don't know you, you do the outreach. You go and find somebody who might need help. Yeah, exactly. So, if, okay, so I'm known as a coach. So if you're not known as a coach, look for the need. Hmm. Success is finding the need and filling it. So just be open, okay? Pay attention, realize there's hurting people everywhere, and then share your story. Hmm. And, and if it's life coach, I don't think most people love their life. Yeah. So everybody's in need. Everybody's Somewhere. in need. Every, everybody's going through something at some point in their life. Here's another way of looking at it. Everybody's coping right now, hmm. okay? So when you go to get gas, if you decide to go in the store to maybe get water or something else, that person, the reason they're acting grouchy could be they're coping with something. So maybe you just say some kind words. So I'm telling you, everywhere around here where I live, I'm coaching probably like 33 people in this whole area that work at places. Hmm. Not joking. If you went with me today, to some of these places, even a Starbucks, probably three of their employees are going to say, hey, Tim Story, and ask me a question. Do you think you need to start off as a karaoke coach and then develop your style, or do you go original from the start? No, no, no. You do have to start off as a karaoke coach. You, 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 you have to mimic somebody to start. So you could see coaches that you, that you look to. Uh, Brene Brown, uh, Iyana Van Zandt, Tim Story. You got you to find coaches that you look to, and then the, the better you get, your own style will begin to emerge. Just like in basketball, like, you know, study, study Michael Jordan, study, mm -hmm. study Larry Bird, mm -hmm. how he dribbles, okay? So it's okay, to, it's okay to be a karaoke coach at first, but don't be a karaoke coach like seven years in. <laughs> Got it. So you, be you, original, that's what we're talking about. So you're putting on the Tim Story hat, you're seeing how it fits, trying it on, but at some point it's gonna feel just a little bit uncomfortable in some spots because it's Tim's story and not you. Yeah, I mean, they're spitting my rhymes everywhere I go. Like everywhere I go, someone's saying, sometimes you gotta get left before you get right. That's Tim's story, right? Uh, don't get stuck in an almost life. That's Tim's story. But what a, what a, what a compliment that now they are karaoke in my songs. Right. Right? And so how do I find that original, original piece? When I'm trying on your hat, the more you, the more you do it, mm -hmm. just like what you do. Okay, you're, you're really good at what you do. So Thank you. the more you do it, it just starts coming out. Then it's just like it's just you. Like, and then you have to trust it. Trust, trust it. it. Have the courage to trust it.
Today we're talking about how to understand your audience. Tim, what do you got for us? Well, you know, every audience is different. So like as a speaker, because you speak as well, mm -hmm. whenever I speak, I got to know what is the culture and what is the climate. So let's say if I'm speaking in Stockholm, Sweden, that's going to be different if I speak in Rome, Italy. So it's a different culture, right? Then the climate is also going to be different. So if like you speak first and you like so hype the crowd up because you're so doggone good. So the climate, I got to understand that too. So that's going to really help me navigate what my approach is going to be. It's the same thing in coaching. Okay. So if somebody is going through a crisis, let's say they're going through a divorce, I got to understand the climate and the culture of what that person is going through. So my tone has to be different. What I'm expecting from that client is going to be different. If it's a person that wants to be coached and they're saying, Hey, listen, the LA Dodgers wants me. And so does the Cincinnati Reds. Look at Tim. This is amazing. Different climate, different culture. You definitely have to understand who you're coaching and what they're going through. How much do you adapt your style to them? versus saying, here's my niche, come to me if you're dealing with this. I totally have to adjust my style. Okay. And that's where people really mess up. Mm -hmm. I, th I think some people are just not good at this, is that they try to bring like a system that worked on person A, B, and C to somebody that's going through a terrible, terrible crisis. Like for instance, I got called to a hospital because someone had been in a very, very serious accident. As soon as I walked in to the hospital, I couldn't believe it that I asked one of my friends to count. There were 33 family members that were hovering around because they thought this man could die. Mm. And they were waiting for Tim story to show up to bring hope. Mm. So I didn't come up and act like Tim story, the motivational speaker. I came in super quiet. I sat down with everybody. I talked to people one on one. I went and saw the person that had been in this accident. Thank goodness he came out of it. He was in a coma. Okay. So the person that brought me in said, I think my family needs to be rallied. They're down. They need to be rallied. That's the last thing they needed. Mm -hmm. They needed somebody just to care about them. So understanding that type of situation, is how I came in and spoke to them. And how do you deal with that? When, when a client asks you to do one thing, but you know, you should be doing the exact opposite. Yeah. You, how do, how you, do you, become, you become good at it. <laughs> okay. So, so okay. I was a really good pitcher when I was a kid. Baseball pitcher. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So if my catcher, so simple, simple signs when you're 12, one is a fastball, two is a curve, three is a drop because I had a wicked drop. So if he went like this, one, fastball, I'm like, I wave him off. I'm not throwing a fastball, that dude, he's gonna hit it over the, over the fence. I'm gonna throw my wicked drop. So I'd wave him off. Mm -hmm. So if I go into a, a accounting situation, even with a celebrity, the manager may say, okay, this is what he needs, man. Right. He totally needs you to, and I go, oh, interesting. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll take that into consideration, but I'm really waving them off. <laughs> right. Yeah. So it's experience. So based on my experience of understanding the climate and the culture of what that person's going through, I need to adjust the way I'm coaching that person. Here's another thing. Some people, the crisis they're in, they're not getting out in one Tim story session, mm. or they're not getting out in one Iyanla Van Zandt changed my life on own network session. Right. Are you with me? Yeah. It's going to take them three months, six months, nine months, a year. I think that's why people keep coming back to me because I'll tell people the truth. I'll say, you know what, man, dude, you've been at this for a long time. It's going to probably take you about 12 months. They're like, no, I don't want to hear that. I go, it's the truth. <laughs> So it's a step-by-step -step process. So I get into the realities with people and understand what they got themselves into. So if they, if they made bad choices to get in that dilemma, it's going to take better choices to get them out. Mm. 
what are some of the signs that you're paying attention to? I'm sure even as you just walk in the room, you're already scanning the room, you're looking at the people, or looking at your clients, seeing their body language. Like, what are the, some of the signs that you're paying attention to that you're saying, okay, I need to go in. Okay, so let's let's get in specific. So understand yeah. your audience, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. Someone is 55 years of age, worked for the same company since he was 22. They fire him, okay? So how do you think he feels? Devastated. So what tone should I come at? You tell me. What tone should I have towards this guy? Empathetic, understanding, low key. I'm bringing it down. Right. Okay, so how does that feel? Like, man, I can't believe they did that. So what are your thoughts right now? I want to get even. I, 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 I want to get on Yelp. I, 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 I want to tell people. Right. I, I, I know secrets about the boss. Maybe that's not what we should do. You get my point? Right. Okay, so if somebody loses their job in their 50s, that's one thing. Okay? If somebody is about to get married in a week and now they're having second thoughts. Similar tone. Okay. Why are you having second thoughts? Because he's a raging fool. <laughs> <laughs> How do you know that? Because of boom, 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 boom. Yeah. Okay. All right, maybe we should reconsider this, even though you've already invited 800 people. <laughs> Yeah, so it depends on the situation. I, I love the voice already, dude. You go into like this. Oh, I go there. Oh, it's great. That's a great voice. That's, yeah, these other guys mess it all up. Yeah, see? <laughs> these other guys mess it all up by, by coming in with like this big life coach tone when a person's in, in crisis. Right. But you gotta remember, I also deal with people that are like living like way up here. So it's like, oh my gosh, you're never gonna believe it. I'm up for Academy Award. So. I don't know if I should invite my ex-wife or I don't know if I should invite my mother-in-law. I'd have to fly her in from Sweden. So that's a whole different tone. Like, hey, yeah, maybe. Hey, that's interesting. Let's look at that. Whole different tone. So you want to match them? Yeah. You got, you got to match where the person's at. You got to match where they're at. How much, how much of the, how much pre-research are you doing on people versus just going in and sensing the vibe when you walk in? Okay, so important. Because here's the deal now, is that it used to be that a lot of coaching was one-on-one. -on -one. So it's me and you at a restaurant. It's me and you at Starbucks. It's me and you on the golf course. Now it's me and you on Zoom. It's me and you on Skype. Right. It's me and you on WhatsApp, right? So I can't always feel it out. So I'll take my time. Like the other day I had a client and I could see that he was a little uptight more than he usually is. And so I just started pushing certain buttons to see where his mood was. And then the guy started getting all emotional and he's not the emotional type. He literally started crying. Mm -hmm. And I was glad that I pushed those buttons and went down to that quiet mode. Now I couldn't touch him, but I was touching him through my tone and through my words. And how important is touch for you in the coaching process? Um, I, think, I think touch is important, not just physical touch, but it's more of an emotional touch. See, because like when I go into prisons, sometimes you can't touch anybody. Mm. There's a glass. So, but I'm still touching them through my tongue. And so that's powerful stuff. Powerful. How do you take that message of a one-on-one -on -one to then translate it to a hundred people who might be watching you in prison? Well, I think that in that case, it, again, it is tone. So let's say that if I'm speaking to a group of prisoners that I know they're gonna get out within a year, I'm teaching maybe on hope. If I'm teaching to a group of prisoners that are in there 10 years to life, I'm teaching at a different tone. I'm teaching on prosper where you're planted, that even though you're in the midst of this, sometimes you gotta get left before you get right. Use this left experience as a library and a sanctuary. To somebody that I know is getting out in 12 months, I'm teaching them about hope and preparing them to get out. So you have to know your audience, guys, you gotta know your audience. And so you gotta understand this also, that I may, I may coach seven people in one day. So I may, I may coach a, a guy that's worth a billion dollars, and then I may coach a young 22 year old who's struggling with addiction. So I better really watch my tone right. between the $20 billion guy and the kid who's struggling with addiction. So you gotta, you gotta shift it up. So I'm constantly watch turning the page, turning the page. See, so even 
you, you and your crew that's here, I was checking out your tone on purpose. Okay. Like I was somewhere and I came back early on purpose. I wanted to know your tone the minute you walked in my house. So what did you get from my tone? How cool you are. Okay. And you're, just, you're, just, <laughs> you're an amazing man. I just felt brilliance all over you. <laughs> I'll, use that, I'll use that as a case study, testimonial right there, Tim's story. That's just how I roll. But, what, so, but how would, so in understanding me, yeah. What do you then shift in, in either the stories you tell or your demeanor or like how are you changing? I shifted you without you even knowing I shifted you. You shifted me. I did today. I mean, I felt that too, but but it's interesting because at the beginning I asked you, you said, well, you need to shift to your to the person that you're dealing with. Yes. So you want to understand me, get into my world, and then you're trying to bring me into no, yours? No, I don't want you in mine. Okay. I want you to get into a state that is best for you to handle the situation. Okay. Okay. So so in, in the in the case of today, you guys have been on the road, you're doing this amazing tour, right? Right. So now you're like, boom, 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 one place to another. So now you see Tim Story. Hi, Tim Story, you're not Grant Cardone. Hi, Tim Story, right. <laughs> uh, you're, you're, you're not President Obama. Sure. It's me, hi, it's Tim Story. So I took my time and then you started to feel my essence and who I am. Okay. Right? Yeah. So then you started to like get on the same wavelength as me. So now we can chop it up and do a better job. That's very Oprah. I very, like it. That's why Oprah is the best at right. what she does. She takes people into her place. Mm. And then how do you do that in such a short amount of time? What are you looking for? What signs? What techniques? Um, listen, dealing with you today is going to be different than dealing with you tomorrow. Okay. It all depends on how you woke up, what kind of food you ate, how you, how you slept, right? So if you're in a different mood tomorrow, I'll handle that mood too. I'm just, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for body language, spoken words, movement, erratic behavior. Yeah. People get blown away. Most managers say nobody has ever been able to talk to my client like this. Like I can name 10 of the biggest entertainers in the world that their managers say nobody can talk to that guy or that lady that way. So I, I pay attention. And they respect you for it. Yes. Because you're telling them the truth. No, I'm bringing them in. Today is episode four. We're talking about how to be a good listener. I'm excited for this one. Yeah, if you're gonna be a coach, I think some people think coaching is verbal, that you're just telling people what to do. Like, oh, you're in this crisis. Here's the seven things you must do. Right. Really, if you're a great coach, you're a great listener. And so let's let's talk baseball just for a second. I love it. Tommy Lasorda, what used to be the coach of the Dodgers, okay? So he was great verbally, but people don't realize that he was also great if if a if a player was struggling, he'd go on the bench and sit next to him, put his arm on him, and just listen. Like, how you feeling today? How's your family? Like during the game. Hmm. Let's take basketball. A Phil Jackson, he was very zen. He was a great listener, anywhere from Michael Jordan all the way to Dennis Rodman. So I think my strength in coaching, I'm a phenomenal listener. Not just good, I'm phenomenal. <laughs> I love it. So, so break that down. How do we become a phenomenal listener? Okay, so first you gotta have three sisters and a mother. <laughs> okay, so here's the deal, right? I have right? two. Okay, well you gotta have three. Okay, so I'm the youngest child. Okay. So. All three sisters older than me. Okay, raised by my mother, because my father passes when I'm 10. So, my older sisters were always telling stories. I'm the youngest. I gotta listen to the stories. I'm hearing about what they're doing at school. I'm hearing about a, a guy they have a crush on. So I just learned to be this good listener. My mother has no husband. My brother is older than me, he's out doing things, so I become the listener to all the words that my mother has and my sisters have, I became a very good listener. So I would say listening is one of the most powerful things I have in my arsenal. Everybody says that. So I could, I could be coaching somebody who's, you know, super well known or not as well known, and they'll say, this is wild. I feel like you really listen to me. 
be a good listener. I love that you say wild because that, that's been our word for the tour. Yes. Everything is wild. So it's great that... Wild is good. I love it. Yes. So I'm a good listener. And so here's, here's what's important. Is that I think in, in listening, too many people are thinking about what they're going to say next. Mm. So let's say if they're a life coach, okay, or life advisor, so they have their manual and they're like, okay, what, what's your two-year goal? What's your four-year goal? If you knew you couldn't fail, what would you want to do? Hey, pay attention to what they just said because in their last answer is probably the gold you're looking for. So let, let's say if I'm life coaching somebody, I'll say, when you were a child, what did you think about becoming? And they may say, uh, I didn't have a clue. I don't go question number two. I'll say, what do you mean you didn't have a clue? Like you, you never thought of it or nobody gave you ideas about it or you never saw something that moved you. I may stick with that answer. I don't never had a clue for 30 minutes and not go to question number two. That's being a good listener. And how do you know that that's guiding you down the right path instead of just meandering around and never getting to the thing that you want to solve? Well, I think, I think that what happens, it depends on whatever the subject is. Okay. So let's, let's just work on you just for a second, just for fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's do it. Okay. All right. So, um, when you were right out of college, okay. what did you think about becoming? Entrepreneur, I was running my business, not having success doing it, turned down big jobs to be an entrepreneur and make 300 bucks a month and own 30% of a company and wanted to succeed. Okay, why did you turn down big jobs? Fear of regret. I didn't want to miss out on not knowing if that company would work or not. How did that feel to turn down those jobs and then in hindsight find out that, oh my gosh, Maybe I turned down a really good opportunity that could have put me in a better position. I had, a, I had something happen a year before that made me have the strength and courage to go off and do it because I didn't want to live my entire life not knowing. I could deal with the failure and I could deal with it not working out and knowing that I could get another job. Yes. I mean, it'd be the same job, but I can get another job. This whole company thing, I didn't know if I'd have the chance again, so I had to do it. Okay, so you want me to tell you what I heard? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, of course. So number one is you had opportunities and you turned them down. Not just regular. Regular means standard, normal, right? You turned down big, which is larger than normal. Right. So did you see how I, I took the word big? Yeah. And then I used big jobs. Then I said, how does it feel? How did that feel to turn down a big job? Because the big job could have left you in a big mess because you turned down the big job, right? Mm -hmm. And then we talked about that. And then you talked about your resilience and where that came from. And I let you explain that. So I got like three great points out of you in just about two and a half minutes. So how would you then use that to coach me on something I'm going through right now. Okay, so then I would say then now, are there some big opportunities that are coming your way now that seem similar to what you went through before? And you may say, oh man, this is weird that you're saying this <laughs> because there are some big things. Right. Okay, so now the first time you turn down the big, but maybe we don't turn it down this time. So we got to really figure out what this opportunity is because just because it's dressed in big this may be the big one we want to take okay see so i'm taking your big opportunity and i'm going from there then i'm saying the thing i like about you is is is, is the fact that you're resilient and then i would say to you where did you learn that resiliency you think it's innate did it come from your family did it come through going through from uh, going through hardships? So where did you get that resilience from? Parents. Okay. Yeah, my mom, immigrant, hardworking, uh, super ambitious, successful woman in a time when it was not accepted or common. Okay. So now by being a good listener, I got big opportunity. You're resilient, and it's innate. 
So, which says to me going forward, if I start coaching you now, this year, and I coach you for 20 years, whenever I see you, I'm going to think to myself, that guy, somehow, some way, somehow, some way, he knows how to get through things because it's in him. It's innate. Hmm. And then, and then how would you find the block? The, the block is probably going to be found in what you say about the situation. Okay. Okay. So, so whatever you're going through, if you verbalize what you're going through, I'm still going to remember this guy is confident enough to pass up big stuff. This guy is resilient. This man learned things from his mother and it's now innate. It's instilled. It's a revelation. Give him any situation. He's going to find a way around it. So like if you have a mountain, now I'm coaching you. Yeah, yeah, it's great. If you yeah. have a mountain in your life, if you don't go through it, you'll go around it. Yep. If you don't go through it or around it, your butt's going over it. Mm -hmm. Pound. Yeah. Bam. Life coaching <laughs> for free right here. <laughs> <laughs> and so if I'm if I'm stuck in a situation, is it reminding me of that? Of that like this is who I am and you're going to bring that back out of me because I've forgotten? If you're stuck in a situation, we got to go back to how you got unstuck last time. Okay. So I got to use a biblical reference, if you don't mind. Great, go for it. Doctrine in world religion. So there's a little guy in the Bible named David. So he's going to fight Goliath. He goes, I killed a lion. I killed a bear. I think I could take down Goliath. So in coaching you, I'm going to go back to your lion, your bear, hmm to build your confidence that you could take down Goliath. See, the thing I like about you is in, in, in our dialogue, there are some things that you've gone through that are like little mini crises that have come up in the last month, right? Sure. Yeah. You killed a lion, you killed a bear, you're going to take that down too. Because you told me. Hmm. You go, oh, it's, it's no big deal, I'm still alive. You killed a lion, you killed a bear, you could take that down. So by being a good listener, I listened that you killed a lion, you killed a bear, you could take down Goliath. If someone's a bad coach, they didn't kill, they didn't hear the lion and the bear story. <laughs> Isn't that brilliant? I like it. I like it. Um, I'm just thinking, is, is part of the reason why we need life coaches so much because people don't have anybody in their life who actually listens to them? You need the right life coach. You just don't need a life coach. You right. need because if, if you're, if you're a golfer, like I'm playing golf tomorrow. If you're a golfer and you have the wrong swing coach, it'll jack you up. <laughs> you need the right freaking mentors. No, man, it's not like, hear ye, hear ye, I need a life coach. No, man, you gotta find the right coach that understands your swing, that understands your flow, that understands your rhythm. And they care enough about you to help you find the obvious in your life. Now, because we're talking about listening. When I'm coaching somebody, I'm looking for the obvious. I'm not always looking for, I'm gonna tell this person what to do next. I'm looking for the obvious. I'm, I'm, I'm looking for what you say, what you've missed, what you've misplaced, what you forgot to do. I'm looking for the obvious. So after talking to someone, probably for about 10 minutes, I'll find they're obvious. And if somebody wants to acquire that skill to find the obvious in 10 minutes or less, Tim's story style? Be a good listener. Here's a good way to, to, to practice. Yeah. Okay. So to some of my clients, I have them wear a rubber band. Okay. And I say to them, because I life coach a lot of powerful men. I got, I got kind of one on here. Yeah. So okay. here, if I got okay. this, so it says perfect. believe. Okay. Yeah. All right. So. So some of my some of my powerful men, they bring their job home, okay, and their wives complain that they're not listening. So I say to them, okay, now I want you to wear this rubber band for like two weeks, and when your wife starts talking, and you wanna cut her off, okay, leave the room, I want you to flick the band. It reminds you to just shh mm. and listen. These guys are coming back with these reports and going, my wife is saying, what happened to you? <laughs> <laughs> you sat there and listened to me talk about curtains like you really loved it. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So it's a great, it's a great, it's a great tool. Boom. You should sell Tim Story rubber bands. Boom. I might. Branded. We'll do it together. I love it. <laughs> Boom. Look, you're not listening. Watch. Boom. See? Boom. Don't you like that? It's meditative. Yes. Listen. Yeah. Being present. Be present. Listen. I'm a good listener. Today, episode five, we're talking about having the right motives. I know this one is personal to Tim. What do you got, man? It's real personal. <laughs> He's Why did you ask me that question? <laughs> That's how personal it is. <laughs> okay. You gotta have the right motives because here's the deal. So if you're life coaching someone, mm. so they feel like they have a need, like what's my career path, right? What should I do? I just got divorced. How can I handle being single? How, how can I handle being married? Uh, I aspire to be this person. So you have to have the right motives, have compassion, empathy, really care about these individuals to give them the proper answers. What do you think, what do you think people's motives are coming in? Okay, I think a lot of people's motives are good. Okay. okay? Like I know a lot of social workers, they don't get paid that much money. So, and they have good motives. I know a lot of psychiatrists that do not get paid that much money. They have good motives. Psychologists, okay, don't get paid that much money. But I know a lot of people in this space of life coaching now because they've seen the money that some people make. Their motives are how many big clients they can get, how they can sell and upsell people to get enormous amounts of money. And they're not thinking about the client, the person, they're thinking about their own personal success. And that irritates me. So what if uh, somebody comes in and says, oh, that person's my next suit, that person's my next car, right? If I close that person, I can get that car, put it up on Instagram. Then you're gonna irritate me. <laughs> yeah, this is gonna irritate me. You know why? Because again, okay, so if, if, if a guy's in a crisis, okay, let, let's take a guy that uh, plays Major League Baseball. So his agent calls for Tim's story. The guy used to hit like about 300 something, and then he went down into the 200s, okay? These are true stories because I do a lot of athletes. So now he's all vulnerable. Hmm. He's like, he's heard what I've done with other athletes. So he's all vulnerable, okay? So he says to me, okay, so what do I do? So I, I got this guy to watch film of when he was hitting over 300 and just watch himself with a swing, just bam, 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 bam. I'm telling you in two weeks, his problem got solved. Hmm. He started getting confidence by just watching the old film, right? What if I didn't care about the guy? But before I had him watch film, I'm, I wanna know about his mother, his father, his two kids, right? I'm joking with him, I'm teasing with him because I care about the person. Now, this is super, super common with me. Where someone will say, I'm in a major crisis, I live in another country. I am flying myself to meet with you. I will pay you 20,000 for the day, 30,000 for the day, money's not an option. I'll say, okay, watch how common this is. I'll sit down with them for lunch, I'm solving their problem, they go to pay and I go, don't want it, keep it. They'll go, what? I got money. I go, I don't want it. Dude, you just paid all that money to fly here and to stay in a hotel, you trusted me enough, I don't want your money. This happens all the time. I would say out of the 10 people that I coach, only about six of them pay. Hmm. I won't take their money. Why are you staring at me? I'm processing it. <laughs> it's the truth. I'm you reap what you sow. I'm processing it because I'm, and we're going way off topic, but I love it. I'm facing that situation right now yes. with what I do on YouTube in that there's a lot of people who are massively successful yes. offline yeah. and want to build a YouTube brand. And I'm helping them for free. Yeah. Just taking the knowledge out of my head and helping them get their message out because they want to build legacy and they see YouTube as a way to spread their message and build legacy. People worth tons and tons and tons of money. Yes. Way more than me. Yeah. And I'm just there helping them. It's all coming back to you. You reap 
what you sow. Okay, so those other guys that are all into their own self, when, when, when Smokey Robinson got his uh, Lifetime Achievement Award for NAACP, did, did he call them? No, he called me. Hmm. Are you with me? All these big plays I'm doing, movies that I'm doing, all these things at the highest level, are they calling them? No, they're calling me. It's not by accident. Is, is Oprah Winfrey hanging out with them? No. Is she hanging out with me? Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> you reap what you sow. <laughs> you reap what you sow. I, I do it because my motives, I love people. Yeah. So if that guy just flew all the way from London to talk to Tim Story, a guy that used to be you know, from a lower income family, and now I really know what I'm talking about, dude, I'm not taking your $20,000 stack. Go on your way. So when do you start to charge? Or how do you start to charge? Well, the reason the reason I charge, the main reason I charge, because I have many ways that I make money, I own a lot of companies, is because I want people to re respect my time and value my time. Because sometimes when I don't charge somebody, I'll say to them, okay, well, they'll, they'll make the appointment with my one of my assistants. And they'll say, okay, I'll get on Zoom at nine in the morning but I'm not charging them. I'm there at Zoom at nine, 910, they're not there. 920, they're not there. 930, starts to tick me off. So I notice that people appreciate what they pay for. For someone who wants to make life coaching their business and they may not make money from all the other all investments the companies, that you join, yeah. like, okay, so I need to I need to charge. When, when do you do it? How do you figure that process out? Again, charge, but let your motives be right. Let it not be about money let it be about helping people. And what's gonna happen is the money is gonna follow you being helpful to people. Like so many of the things that happened to me, like holy schmoly, walk a moly. People would try to give me everything. They try to give me horses, boats, sailboats. I'm not even joking. I think you need a horse in here. This'd be great. Yeah, they, <laughs> they try to give me everything. It's not by accident. You reap what you sow. But for those that are starting in coaching, charge, but make your prices reasonable. If you're the fir your first year in coaching, you know, come on, be reasonable. Second year, be reasonable. I've been coaching people for almost 30 years. So my prices are higher than most, but they're not even near what some of my peers charge, just because I care. So taking it personal for me, if you needed, if you wanted to do YouTube, yeah, I would just help you. Yes, and I would, I would spend a lot of time and care and effort looking at your channel and looking at your analytics and come up with suggestions, and I would treat it like it was my own. Yes, because I want you to win. I want your message to get out. Even these videos, I want your message to get out there. And that's why and we're spread. sitting here today, right? Because before we did this segment, I said something to you. Okay, I'm older than you. Okay, I'm in my 50s, and I said to you, hey, I like you. If you need something, I got your back. I ain't playing. Like, I can, I could do things. Does that make sense? Yeah. I don't say that to everybody. I like your vibe. I like your family's vibe. I like your staff's vibe. So, you reap what you sow. You didn't ask me. I said it during the break. Good stuff, right? It's good stuff. It's just figuring out the balance. Come on, when you got Oprah, yeah, and Oprah will probably watch this, and and I'm just chilling with her, and she goes, tell me what you want. That's good, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I love this guy. <laughs> I don't even know what we're talking about anymore. Have the Have right the motives. motives. <laughs> Have the right motives. motives. You know why? Yeah. It's gonna come back to you, man. It's gonna come back to you. Do you believe people are good? Fundamentally? I think people are good, but they put bad stuff in them. <laughs> I think they came out of their mother's womb pretty good. Mm. But so like, if I, have a, if I have a cup and it's empty, depending on what I pour in it is whether I should drink it or not. So you gotta really watch what you watch with your eye gate and what you hear with your ear gate. So I'm constantly monitoring what I watch and what I hear, so I keep my motives pure. It's all about character. And if you if you if you suck in a certain area, get better. I'm not talking about being angelic. I'm just saying get better. Have motives. 
have the right motives. You have the right motives, the world will come looking for you. I don't advertise over and over and over. We let people know we have services, but man, I've stayed busy all these years because people look for us. I love it, man. This is episode six on how to have the right mindset. What do you got, man? Okay, when you think mindset, what do you think? Smart, I'm talking to a smart man. Um, you put me on the spot, it's the best, I love it. I think, uh, I think making sure that you're you're motivated every day, making sure that Ooh, you're good. coming from service every day. Yes. Making sure that you're feeling bold every day. Good. And that you're showing up every day. Okay, good. How's All right, that? so so if you're coaching me, okay. I need you to have that to come to me. Okay. Because here's what I here's what I say. If you have nothing to give, how are you going to help me? So a lot of people like they say, I want to give, I want to, I want to help, I want to, I want to help the hurting. Okay, I'm glad those are your motives, like we talked about earlier. But you have to have the right mindset. You have to be filled with the right things. You have to be clear. You have to have clarity. You have to have knowledge. You have to have compassion. So the mindset is so, so, so important in coaching. You cannot coach well with an empty head. Hmm. You've got to come filled. Do you know that before I coach people in the morning, I, because because of my spiritual background, I do devotions, okay. okay? I pray and I go to the gym. So by the time I coach somebody early in the morning, I'm like, I'm prepared, bam, to go at it. I don't just like roll out of bed and then try to help somebody through their dilemma. Got to have the right mindset. How do you avoid, so a lot of people who do prayer, sometimes the, they come out of the prayer and it's and it's meaningful and they're moved and yeah. they felt a the connection and they're set to go. And other days they just kind of went through the motions, read the prayer, asked for something, but then they don't have the same emotional connection after. How do you make sure that you come out of that prayer every single day feeling on fire. Ready okay, to go so we're talking we're talking about how to strengthen your mindset. Mm -hmm. Because prayer and meditation will strengthen your mindset. Okay? And the mindset will change your mood set. I guarantee you. Mm -hmm. The mindset will change your mood set. So here's how I look at prayer and meditation. It is like plowing the ground and planting the seed. You plow the ground, you plant the seed. You don't just get the harvest the same every day. So some days you'll meditate and you'll pray. It doesn't feel the same, but you still have been plowing and then planting seed. But the seed that you planted may affect you in 30 minutes, but it may affect you in two days, three days, four days, five days. So a lot of my prayer and meditation and my devotional time is not just for the present, but it's for my future. See, that's very, very powerful. Mm. So I'm, today's decisions are tomorrow's realities. Mm -hmm. This is the way I say it. So today's decisions are tomorrow's realities. So, so if I pray today and I study today, I may feel it today or I may feel it in three days, but I'm going to feel the change. So today's decisions are tomorrow's realities. What's, what's the mindset that you want to have on a daily basis? What, what adjectives would you use? I want to have a mindset of clarity hmm. I want to go into a coaching session because we're talking about being a life coach right I want to I want to go into that coaching session with clarity and because the coach may be going through their own dilemma so I got to make sure that I'm handling my emotions and the challenge of my mindset so I can now hear what's going on here because like somebody may say, I may say, hey, how are you doing? And they say, uh, not so well. Uh, a great friend of mine passed away. Mm -hmm. If you're not paying attention, you may say, oh, that's great. So let's talk about what we talked about last time. Right. People will miss it. Right. Okay, so clarity is super, super, super important. So that's where the meditation, the prayer, the devotion, 
helps me to gain clarity, to deal with myself as an instrument of change, to then also be able to be a better listener, as we talked about earlier, to the client that's talking to me. How about the mindset for you going into the next event or next session with a client yes. where maybe something happened? I used myself as an example. On our before we came here, yes, my car was robbed. Yes, I lost my wallet, my driver's license, my six debit cards, all of my gear from my workshops and presentations, everything gone. Thousands and thousands of dollars worth of, of stuff, plus headache, all gone. Now we got to go drive to Tim's story <laughs> and do a yes. ten-part series. So, what would you do in that kind of situation where you had something negative happen to you, maybe just now, and then ten minutes later you have to jump into a session? Okay, with so number one. I give, I give you and your family credit for how you handled it. Okay, thank you. you. you gotta, again, you gotta understand, I'm in my 50s, you're younger than me. So you, you tell me the story, right? Then how did I respond to you? Was I compassionate? Absolutely. Like for a long time, right? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Okay, do you need anything? What can we do? Like, oh wow, like let's take a while to transition. But you, you guys transitioned so quickly, and a lot of it is because of your mindset. Your mindset was, at least I'm still alive. Right. Nobody got injured. They didn't take it all. That's your mindset. Mm -hmm. So your mindset helped you get through the dilemma, which was super, super powerful. Okay? So I commend you. Thank you. On that. So here's what's very, very important. Anybody can learn from this, whether you're a life coach, or you're a, a mother, a father, somebody dealing with somebody that's in a crisis, is that clarity is so important. So what I feel like you did is you realize your loss, you saw Tim's story, you came in my house, you kind of like shook yourself you turn the page and then you just kept going forward. Mm. Okay? To get the right mindset, you gotta shake it off and you gotta sometimes just turn the page. It's the this too shall pass. That's powerful stuff, don't you think? I love it and I, I love the visual too. You gotta turn the page. Doing, yeah. You turn the page. Mm -hmm. So at this point, it, 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 it doesn't almost feel like you, like you lost everything thing right this second, right? Because we're so in this flow, right? Yeah. Okay. So life is going to give you the grace to handle the loss after these great interviews. And that's a beautiful thing about your life. So you, you're, you're, you're a person of faith. So grace fills in the gaps. Hmm. We all go through crap we don't like, but grace fills in the gaps. Hmm. So that's having the proper mindset. Uh, what do you recommend for your clients to do on a daily basis? You have your practice, you have your, your devotion, you have your workout. Do you guide your clients through a process to figure out a routine in the morning that sets them up for success? I think that they should get the Tim Story app, the utmost app on iTunes. Okay. Because <laughs> I do have an app. So I have an app that walks you through seven days of your week of how to be strong mentally, spiritually, emotionally, physically, and I even have meditations on this app. So it's called the Utmost App with Tim Story. But for my clients, I give them a lot of books to read. There's a really good book called Quiet. I don't know if you've ever read that okay. book. No. It's, it's about being still and being okay with being still. Mm -hmm. See, we have become human doings, this is a Tim Story saying, rather than human beings. And I'm, I'm telling you, we're missing it, man. Have you noticed how still I am? Yeah. I'm like, I'm just like, bam. Like, I'm just looking at all your power. I'm not like, ooh, what's next? I'm right here. So I'm, I'm super still. My mindset, my mindset, I tell you, is like, I say it this way. A magical mindset is your VIP pass anywhere. There's nowhere I can't get into with this. Hmm. This has got me everywhere. And do you think that that process that you go through of training, whether it's the devotion in the gym or the, the seven steps in your app, 
are they mostly universal? Like everybody needs quiet time. Everybody needs to go work out. Or there's one hundred percent universal. You're going to use them for different things. Okay. If a woman has six kids or a man has six children, so you're going to use all that to handle having six children. <laughs> if a man's working two shifts, he's going to use it for that. If a man is Steve Harvey, then he's going to use what I'm saying for being Steve Harvey. So depending on your obligations and the way you do life is how you use those. But it's all universal. But everybody needs quiet time. Everybody, man, we were, we were made to be quiet. Mm -hmm. We don't do well unless we're quiet. We, we were made to sleep without the television on. We were made to drive sometimes with no radio on. We were, we were made to stop, look, and listen, and download beautiful thoughts from heaven. Is your devotional quiet time? My devotional is quiet time. I call it, I call it the holy ground versus the battleground. Okay. The world is the battleground, okay? So you're just minding your own business and then they, they steal from your car. Right. That's the battleground, okay? On a lighter version, we could go to a restaurant later tonight and the server may be in a bad mood and act funny. That's the battleground, okay? So the battleground is just life, all the stuff that life's thrown at you. You need to go to the holy ground. The holy ground is that place of quiet where you get secrets, where you feel safe, where you feel significant, and to me, where I'm hearing from God. So my holy ground is my strength from my battleground. See, I don't answer everybody's call because my, my phone's ringing right now because everybody is having an urgent, or somebody is having an urgent somewhere, but their urgent, according to Stephen Covey, their urgent is not necessarily my urgent. Mm. So thank God for that caller ID stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even have a number on my cell phone. Uh, that's amazing. So we all need quiet time minimum. What do you think? Mindset, it depends on the person. Like I need a lot because I'm, I, I go through a lot. So I'm like an hour of day of just like, boom. I'm in, I'm in the trenches, but that's why I'm. So you'll wake up and do an hour of day of devotional in the morning, yes. first thing. Like a machine. I love it. And then, and then I work come out, out like a machine. You, okay. I go to the gym. I'm already a machine before I hit the machines. Because of the quiet time you had. Heck yes. Interesting. Yeah. And I and I get all these calls from overseas and like, I can see like urgent, urgent, urgent. Ur no, I can't do that. Because if I don't get filled up, I got nothing to give. And is there anything else that people need to be doing on a daily basis to get the mindset? Well, if they can't just sit at home and get the mindset driving their car with no music on or driving the car with meditation music on and just and just flow okay whether you you're quietly praying or just meditating however you do life but just do that you could also do it by listening to like a book like getting one of these books that we're talking about and listen to a book on tape and you're listening and you're you're meditating and you're pondering and you're thinking and you're muttering. That's meditation. So, you know, the Bible says, as a man thinketh, so is he. So no wonder I'm so doggone clear because I choose to watch what I think about. I'm very, very careful. Hmm. I don't listen to a bunch of negative stuff. If somebody's speaking negative, I just, I kind of zone out. And would you call your devotional prayer? For me, it is, because that's my faith. So my, my, my devotional is a prayer life that I have to God. But also, I'm studying like Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. So like Psalms 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The word want in the Hebrew means I shall not have anxious desire. So I'll meditate on that and I'll say, Thank you, God, that today I will not have an anxious desire, that no matter what comes my way, I will not be anxious. No matter what takes place, no matter what people say to me, no matter what people do to me, I will not be anxious. So someone can come to me and say, oh my God, I Googled you, and somebody said something negative about you. I go, oh, that's all right, they'll be okay. And I mean it. Hmm. But you should see what they said. No, that's okay, they'll be okay. They go, no, they, they said about you. I said, that's okay, they'll be okay. Hmm. But I really mean it, because I'm that into what, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not have anxious desire. 
So I choose not to have anxious desire. It's my choice. If, if we pull on that thread a little bit more, Faith, uh, James 1, 5, and 6 talks about how you get wisdom from God. Yes. So it's not just praying for forgiveness or praying for blessings or gratitude, but wisdom. Perfect. So in your time of meditation, that's a great scripture. In your time of prayer and meditation, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Right. And so that's what's happening. God's downloading wisdom. Let me just tell you something. Me and you are living beyond our pay grade. <laughs> okay. We're, you're going to make a lot of money. I'm going to make a lot of money. Our families are going to be blessed. They're, they're going to be blessed three generations down. That's just the way it's going to be, okay? But I need God's wisdom to do what I do. I'm, I'm just, uh, what I have to deal with every day is so up here. Hmm. I need his wisdom, but he gives it to me. So do you pray for wisdom every morning? I, I, I don't pray for wisdom every morning. Because I haven't talked to you about that. That was a good scripture you reminded me of. But I pray and I get wisdom. Hmm. But now that you've reminded me of that, I'm going to pray for wisdom as well. All right, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> so you, Pump that you, up. You, you just add it to my life. I love it. Come back tomorrow. And we'll see. There he He's even wiser if that's possible. <laughs> uh, and, and for people who aren't religious. Yeah. What's what is what's the meditation? What's the process? If they were going to spend an hour, what are they doing in that hour? Well, a lot of people are not religious and they're doing great. You know, they're just they're they're just being quiet. So it could be a walk on the beach, right? Some guys are surfers that I know, just being out there surfing. Some people do yoga. Uh, some people are, are are running and they're just in a in a zone. I think it's more uh, about it's more about being quiet. But the, the great thing about prayer to this amazing, powerful God is that the God who created me is downloading heavy information. So I'll go that way. Cool, man. Today is episode seven, how to have the right business partners or just right partners? What are we, what are we going down with this one? Well, I think it's it's the right partners in life, like yeah. we're partners, but okay. then you have to have the right business partners as well. So you want me to explain that? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so in anything that we do, so much emphasis is being on being the right person. So everybody's like, you know, I'm vegan or, you know, I don't eat meat or exercise. And you should be the right person, right? So you have to be the right person, but then people talk a lot about having the right plan. But you could be the right person with the right plan and have the wrong partners and mess the whole thing up. Okay. So we're talking about Tim's story, the life coach, right? Mm -hmm. So I could be the right person with the right plan and coaching in all the things I do, Steve Harvey, Facebook, uh, Oprah Winfrey stuff that I do, uh, my one-on-one -on -one clients, TV shows, all the stuff that I do right in coaching, right? So I could be the right person with the right plan, but have the wrong partners. And you know what's gonna happen? I'm gonna get paralyzed in that same spot. Mm. So. I need to get around people that are gonna lift me up and strengthen me to another level. Do you mind if I use a, yeah, a, a, a Bible verse? Yeah. Okay, so the Bible says this, he who walks with the wise will become even more wise himself, mm -hmm. but a companion of fools, his life will unravel. <laughs> okay. Okay, so you have 24 hours a day and I have 24 hours a day. So in your line of business, in my line of business, if we're not careful, we will have people that do not have wisdom that will try to come into our inner circle and they will cause our life to begin to unravel. Mm. But if I partner with somebody who's wise, the Bible says I will stack up more wisdom. Mm. So in my 24 hours a day that I have, Man, I want to walk with the wise and I want to become more wise. I want to stack up more wisdom. So right person, right plan, got to stack up more wisdom. What do you suggest when the people who are the fools who are unraveling you are your parents, or your best friends, or your sister? Yes, okay. So what you got to do, you always have to be friendly, fair, but sometimes firm. So it's a great book called Boundaries. Hmm. 
And so I, I am I am a pro at boundaries. I think I'm I think I'm really good at boundaries. Okay. And so um, on the spiritual tip, I got to go there again. That that Jesus had levels of partners. He had the one, his father, that he spoke to. Then he had the three, Peter, James, and John, the sons of thunder. Then he had the 12, in which Peter, James, and John were part of. Then he had the 70. To the one, the father, he told him everything. To the three, he told them a lot. To the 12, he told them a lot. To the 70, he spoke in parables. It's very powerful, right? Hmm. So there are people that come into our life that are not supposed to know your inside stuff because they may not be able to handle the truth. Even if that's your mom. Even if that's your mom. So you're nice to your mom, but you may speak to her in parables. Because she may say to you, what are you talking about this tour you're going on? Why so many cities? Make sense? Mm -hmm. But you know you're supposed to do it. So you respect her, you're friendly, you're fair, but you're firm in your own convictions and you're like, Oh, you know, mom, that's an interesting way of looking at it. And then you book Las Vegas. <laughs> and Powerful stuff. W would you recommend then just avoiding topics that you know will trigger? Because there's gotta be still enough if it's your mom or your friend, there's enough love there on other topics. You talk about almost anything else except for this thing that you know is gonna cause conflict. Okay, so we're talking about the right partners yeah. and, we'll, and we'll keep it on this whole life coaching thing, okay? Yeah. But I'm a coach, you're a coach, but we still have lives. So the family that we have, like they say, you don't pick your family, you're born into the family. Mm. So I gotta deal with family dynamics, but that doesn't mean I'm gonna tell all my family members what I'm really thinking. Mm -hmm. Because just cause you're in my family doesn't mean you're in my three or my 12, you might be in my 70. So I'm gonna speak to you in parables. So they may say to, say to me, Man, so so, what did Kanye say to you? I heard that he talked to you about something. I'll go, well, you know, he's a good guy and um, we talked about his new music. I'm not gonna tell him because they're gonna go tell somebody else. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Makes sense? Mm -hmm. And so I think, again, we're always friendly, we're always fair, but we're still firm in our, con in our convictions and, and knowing that not everybody's gonna get you. Here's another way of saying it. You cannot get an FM radio station on an AM dial. Hmm. Somebody that was raised with you may have understood you at 15, but they don't understand you now. Hmm. Make sense? Yeah, no, I hear you. So if you tell them all your dreams, they're not on the same frequency as you. On the business side of things, who are the types of partners that you need to have success as a life coach? Okay, here's the great thing about partnering with people. Mm -hmm. I don't know Richard Branson, but I can watch his TED Talk. I don't know Richard Branson, but I can read his biography. That's powerful stuff, right? I don't know Margaret Thatcher, she's not around, but I can read the biography. I don't know Winston Churchill, never give up guy, mm -hmm. but I can read all these things about his life and watch documentaries about him. So this is a beautiful thing about life. There's certain things I don't know, I can go to your YouTube channel and find out now. So I can partner with you and you may never even meet me. Hmm. It's beautiful, it's a beautiful thing. I go all over the world, 75 countries. I was in Turkey not too long ago. This guy runs to me, to me from, I'm in Istanbul. And he's like, hey Tim Story, oh my God. I'm like your biggest fan. He was like quoting me left and right. Never met the guy. He's in Istanbul. Right. But he's partnering with me because he watches me. Hmm. So so that's a mentorship kind of partnership. Well, yeah. I mean, it's they could they could now read our books, hear us speak, hear a podcast, watch you on YouTube, and we don't all have to be best buddies. You could just take things that pertain to your life. But I do not believe that you could be a great life coach unless you have the right partners in your life. So I am constantly having to elevate my coaching skills hmm. because of the type of people I coach. So when you have one of the presidents, like a former president, who reads your book, like he read mine, 
as his devotional hmm. for months. So, so the type of coaching I do is at such an interesting level. I better have some access to some people that could give me some advice from time to time. And so where do you see as your next phase of partnerships, I guess? Who, do you, who else do you need to be partnering with? To... You. Okay, great. <laughs> no, I'm, I learn from people. See, for, I love Pharrell Williams, and yeah. he's always cool with me. But Pharrell, he talks about being a sponge. Mm. I'm a sponge. I'm learning from everybody that's in this room. So from you today, I see, I see that mindset of yours, okay? I see your, your education. I see you're from Canada, but yet I don't see you're from Canada. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So they're like, there's so many sides of you that I'm, I'm, I'm learning. I'm learning how you do uh, this, this, this broadcast that we're doing today. You're very like disciplined. So I'm, I'm, I'm learning, I'm learning from you. So when I leave you today and you leave me, I just look, I just took a part of you. Thanks. No doubt. Great. So if I'm with Quincy Jones, I took a part of him. If I'm with you, I took a part of you. Quincy Jones said one of my favorite lines of all time. Give it to me. Not one drop of my self-worth comes from your opinion of me. Okay. You can't beat that. Quincy Jones has been such an important part of my life. He's the one that nicknamed me The Voice. Okay. He says that Tim's story is the voice of encouragement of our generation, and then he doesn't play around. He's the one that gave the label to Michael Jackson, the king of pop. And I asked Quincy Jones one time, I said, how come some people with one hit don't have more hits? And I'll never forget, it was like 12.08 at night, because he likes to stay up late. Because I remember I looked at the clock, I thought, I better go. And then I asked him that question and he stood up. He goes, little brother, it's one of the best questions you've ever asked. He said, because there were more hits underneath, but they didn't have it in them to dig and dig and dig and dig. Mm -hmm. Most people are satisfied living off the one hit. And then he grabbed me, he goes, don't be satisfied living off the one hit. Dig and dig and dig. Isn't that powerful? Can't be satisfied, man. Gotta dig. I love it. Gotta have the right partners. That's what we're talking about. What are some other powerful questions you've asked? To you or to Quincy? Anybody. Uh, a, good, a good thing that I learned from Lee Iacocca. Iacocca was like Richard Branson before Branson, Jeff Bezos before Bezos, is about this thing about pace and speed and everybody trying to do it all now. Iacocca says to me, it's not how fast you move your feet, it's how big your strides are. <laughs> Bam, game over. I love it. So someone who's starting out trying to be a life coach, trying to figure out who the right partners are for them, know that there's another gear inside them that they're not hitting yet. Yeah. And then, and then pay attention to the people you resonate with. If you resonate with Tim's story, follow me. If you resonate with Iyana Van Zandt, follow her. If you resonate with Brene Brown, pay attention to her. So whoever you connect with, pay attention to them, learn from them. But again, as we talked about in an earlier segment, you've been born an original, don't die a copy. Mm -hmm. So mimic us at first, and then your own fresh style will emerge. How important do you think on that topic do you think it is to try to learn from the person who you don't immediately connect with? Because if I, if I look at you or Yanla or Oprah or Eric Thomas or a bunch of other people, yeah, it's the same messages. Similar. Similar messages. Yes. Totally different style and tone. Yes. You know, Eric Thomas is going to yell at you through everything. Yes. And Oprah's going to hug you through everything. Yes. You will resonate with one over the other. How important is it in your mind to try to learn from the other person? It's so important. If your strategy, hang out with passion. If your passion, hang out with strategy. Mm. Most of the people I study are not from where I come from. I come from like LA, deep LA. Most people I study are like from Europe, from South Africa, they're brainiacs. They were raised a certain way. So a lot of the people that, People often say about me, if you put all Tim Story's friends 
in a room, you would not understand how this all happened. <laughs> because I have like some of the coolest, nerdiest friends, and then I hang out with rap stars. <laughs> you're, you're a wild duck. I love it. Who are you? Who are you partnering with now? Who's who are you messing with? Who are you trying to learn from? You mentioned Mother Teresa is one of your early mentors. Yeah, I mean, I'm reading about Mother Teresa. I never got a chance to hang out with her, but um, I mean, come on, man. Let's let's talk about being in the studio with Kanye West when he was doing the song Stronger. All he had was a beat. Do 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 do. Whatever doesn't kill me makes me stronger. To go from that to then say I'm going to put strings on it to then say I'm gonna bring in Timberland to help me, to then Pharrell Williams to come in and say, man, if I was you, I'd change it this way, to then Will I Am say, ooh, that's cool, but if I was you, I'd do it this way. To see the beginning of Stronger and then to see how so many people were affected by that song, just even by the hook, whatever doesn't make me, kill me, makes me stronger, uh, I learned just in sitting in that. And I remember one time I told Kanye, I said, man, if I was you, I would put this in, because I'm pretty good with words. He goes, he goes, Tim, that's why you're not a rapper. <laughs> <laughs> What's the Tim Story version of that song? Uh, it, it was thrown out, man. He just, he, he didn't want to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I'm here with the legend, Mr. Tim Story. This is part eight, and we're talking about marketing. Now, Tim, you are the Forrest Gump of this industry. You are the, the, the wild duck, the weird bird. Thank you. seems to have it all kind of figured out. People coming to you, A-list celebrities, athletes. How, how do people do it? How do you become that magnet for great clients? You know, the, the interesting thing is, and that's why I need your help on this subject, is because the way most people marketed themselves to become really, really good at what they do. Like if, if I was to go through Facebook or if I look at Instagram, I see a lot of ads from like really good guys. I won't, I won't name their names, but I see all these ads. If you go through Facebook, Instagram, you're not gonna see these Tim Story ads. But yet, look at the reach I have from TV shows to movies to plays, speaking to uh, 75 countries, getting upwards to 2,000 invitations a year. Wow. So how, how did it happen? That's what I'm asking you though, right? I mean, the way I see it is you just go in and you provide insane value that people want to talk about you and they want to spread the message and they want to have you come back. And you, then totally, you totally gave the answer. Okay. So the answer to me is value. So I remember one time I was going to go to Rome. So a friend of mine said to me, oh man, you gotta go to this restaurant. And so he gave me the name of the restaurant and I kind of thought it would be like in the Beverly Hills part of Rome, almost by the Spanish steps there. Mm -hmm, yeah. And we just kept going down and down and down and down. I mean, it was like all these curves and then it looked like a little house. But this was this restaurant that everybody wanted to go to because of this amazing chef. But I, I thought about something, that this guy was so good at making food that we went down all these twists and turns just to eat his food. Mm. That's how I wanted to be as a coach. I wanted to have such value, right? That you gotta try to find him. You know, there was a time about five years ago, I knocked my whole website out on purpose. So, you know, I'm timstory.com. I knocked it out for two years on purpose just so people couldn't find me easy. Hmm. And it worked. Because sometimes mystery is what people are looking for. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? Now, do I believe in marketing? Yes. Do I believe in taking out ads? Yes. Okay. Do I, do I believe in funnels if they're good? Yes. But I also believe in what Prince did as an artist. So you never saw like Prince as an artist marketing himself on Facebook or Instagram. He was mysterious. So Prince could say to people, I'm playing at 12 midnight on February 14th at the House of Blues. You'd see Madonna in the front row, Justin Timberlake. This is all a true story. Gwen Stefani, 
biggest models, Stevie Wonder. Why? His value was so great, you'd show up at 12 midnight, boom, because it was Prince. Mm -hmm. So I think value is what's driven people to me and to you. How did, how did you get your first client? First client came from, this is an interesting one. I was in seminary and um, a friend of mine asked me to speak at an ROTC group. I was a sophomore in seminary and I was not a speaker yet. And so uh, I said, you know, I don't really know what to say. And he helped me with some notes and I went, I was really funny. So they said, can you come back? And so I started going back. And so it was, it was every Tuesday to speak to this group. It kind of shocked me when every time they'd give me an envelope and I had a $50 check that said Tim's story. Cause I never did it for the money, but they gave me $50. So that was good when you're young. Cause then you can buy gas and you know, do your laundry. But then something happened to me where I got a break. As I got just a little bit older, I was speaking somewhere and Reggie White was there. Reggie White was a famous football, football player yeah. for the Philadelphia Eagles at one time. And he was there and he saw me and he said, hey, man, I like you. He goes, I wanna start booking you in chapels to motivate NFL players. I'm in my 20s. Reggie White, the Reggie White, starts booking Tim Story in all these chapels. Now, this is how the life coaching started. This is so cool. See, some things in life you decide, other things you discover, mm. okay? So when I would speak at these chapels, when I'd get done, guys would come up and go, hey man, can I get your phone number? I'd like to hook up with you. So some of the biggest stars in the NFL, I'm in my 20s, started asking me for my number. I started coaching before I realized I was coaching. Mm. Isn't that cool? They started paying me before I realized that I was in the business of coaching. So I, I, I think that it was one of those things, because you know I love the, the Bible. A man's gift makes room for him and brings him before great men. Hmm. But let's go back to standard approaches of, of marketing. Because as you said, I'm, I'm a bit of a Forrest Gump, okay? I do believe in the way a lot of my buddies market. Like a Grant Cardone, he needed to fill up a stadium in Miami. He had billboards, he had marketing, he had cross promotion. You know, even I had a commercial for him. So a lot of people, you know, cross promoted because we love him. And so, you know, he had like about 35,000 people and you got to market at times. And so I, I believe in marketing, but I believe in, in, in marketing and making sure you're fishing in the right, watch, pond. Hmm. Make sure you're fishing in the right pond. Does that make any sense to yeah, you? Yeah, absolutely. What does that mean to you to fish in the right pond? But you have to be targeting the right people. Exactly. Right, ideal clients. What, what was super interesting for me was your entire marketing strategy seemed to revolve around your very first speaking gigs. Yes. You're getting paid 50 bucks yeah. a time. And the key thing that came back to me, the words that you said were, we want you to come back. Yes. Because you want you to come value. back. We want yeah. you to come back. So I, I would say most places I've ever been invited, I get invited back over and over and over and over. A lot of people that I coach, because I do one-on-one -on -one coaching, the reason I have a line to coach with me is because the same people keep signing up. I have some people that I've been coaching for 25 years, and I don't coach them every week. Some of them I coach like every other week or once a month, but very powerful people who run Beverly Hills. But I guess I must be offering value in a service that they need. They want you to come back. Yes. People just keep wanting you to come back. Yeah, but I do believe in marketing. Yeah. But strategic marketing and understanding who your client is. Again, I'm a good comeback coach. If you, if you need a comeback, call me. So if I'm a life coach, I want to build my brand. I want to get new clients. I don't necessarily want to sell at a stadium of 35,000 people, right? Fishing in the right pond. That's not my pond if I'm a life coach. Yeah. How do you recommend I go about starting to market my services? I think one thing is, is to do things 
for free for a period of time. A lot of people don't like this, but I really do believe in, in giveaways. Do you know that several writers that have had best-selling books, they never went out to have a best-selling book. Mm. They wrote a book, created like an e-book, and sent it to like 20 friends. Just as I care, I want to bless you. Mm. The friend saw it and went, holy schmoly guacamole. I, I can name a, a few, but I'm not going to. Same thing with coaching. As you, if you're working on your brand, coach a few people for free. And then they'll be the happy ones, and then they'll tell a friend, and so on, and so on, and so on. Word of mouth is super, super powerful. Most of the, the celebrities I have, which I life coach right around 300 celebrities, and people say, how do you do all of them? I don't do them all at once. It's, it's, it's word of mouth. It's, they didn't necessarily see me on Oprah or Steve Harvey or something. It's usually word of mouth. How many people could you take on at once? I have a lot, but I have a lot of energy. <laughs> <laughs> we know that. <laughs> but I got a lot. What, like, what's what's the upper first for a life coach watching? Yes. What's a what's a what's a higher end number of people that you think somebody should be able to manage? If at somebody once? if somebody is coaching in one day, I think five clients a day is enough at one hour. Right. Because I think you, sh you should coach, there needs to be a small break. You should coach, there needs to be a small break. You definitely need to, as we talked about earlier, you need to turn the page for a second. Right. And so I know coaches that like coach eight hours straight, eight clients, man, you almost need somebody to like shovel you off and take you to the next destination. It's, it can be exhausting. Especially with what you're dealing with. Yeah, I mean, I'm dealing with some heavy duty stuff that can really change somebody's life. Like, you know, you know some people I coach. I mean, I've been with like some of the most famous celebrities in the world and the next day they're gonna go on national TV and talk about a huge dilemma. Right. I mean, I can name two guys like that right now. When I say guys, it could be one could be a man, one could be a woman. But I better like be fresh Eight hours of coaching straight is not going to make me fresh. Got it. And how important do you think the branding of you being the comeback guy has been to your success? Changed my life. Okay. Changed my life. And you want to know how that happened? Yeah. So I was playing golf with a sports agent. Okay. And another friend who's a producer. And I missed a putt. I'm a golfer. I'm going to Palm Springs to golf. I'm leaving tonight. So I missed a putt. And the guy goes like this. You had a setback. It's the truth. Because we were playing competitive. And I go, I did. But I'm not going to take a step back. And I said, in fact, <laughs> I'm not going to sit in my setback. I'm not going to settle in my setback. And I'm not going to cement myself in my setback. And then the guy goes, have you ever said that before? I go, no. I said, in fact, when I'm feeling the sting of my setback, life is about to give me my comeback. And the guy goes, oh, my God, you're on fire. <laughs> he goes, write it down. <laughs> That's how I started the comeback teaching. This was, this was in the late 80s. And I went and I started writing it down on my little scorecard. And so we had like five more holes to go. I literally wrote all 12 chapter titles wow. while I was on the freaking change my life. Wow. That statement changed my life. Could you imagine being like on Super, Bowl, Super, Super Soul Sunday with Oprah, right? And then, you know, you hug her, you're in Santa Barbara, you've seen her show. And then you sit down, and she's my buddy, so I don't know what she's gonna talk to me about. But she sits down and she, she has my comeback and beyond book, and she goes, oh my God, I love what you say in page 67. I'm like, oh my gosh, my life is changing. <laughs> Oprah is holding my book for one hour. <laughs> it all started on the golf course. You got to hang around that buddy of yours from the golf course more often. Exactly. So marketing, marketing for you is important. Mm. Marketing for me is important. Marketing for me now is for me to keep being Tim Story. Love it. To 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 go through airports and still be the guy that's high fiving people, loving people, you know, wherever I am, still being that guy. That's marketing because it's word of mouth. It's like, hey, he he come he came from here. 
but now he lives this way, but he's still cool. That's marketing. This episode is number nine on how to price your services. What advice do you have for us, Tim? Man, this is a good one. Pricing. Okay, so if I go to Kohl's, Target, or Walmart, okay, I can get a t-shirt at a good price, right? If I go to Dolce Cabana, if I go to Armani, it's gonna be a little pricier, right? Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing about it, the, th the more I'm learning about clothing, is that the quality may just be a little bit different. So you, you, you're basically paying for the brand, you, you, you're, you're paying for the name. And so I find with pricing that you should really take your time before you go to those high prices. I find so many new coaches, mm. okay? They see coaches like myself or others that have been around for a long time. I've been doing it over 20 years, right? And then they try to hit the pricing that we're at and they get frustrated. I think first you have to prove your value, okay? And by proving your value by somebody's life being changed, they're making better decisions, they're having a better life, they're manifesting greater things, then what happens, they start to talk about your services and then your pricing can then go up. So we talked in the last episode about doing work for free at the beginning, just to yes. build your brand, build the marketing. Is it just trying to get as many people? You're just trying to touch as many people, get the practice in, get the reps in, get better, try to do as many as you can without burning out and yeah. just to get the word of mouth going and then you start charging? Yeah, and I, th I think that it's it's not even just as many, it's the quality, okay? So so let me life coach you. So so let's say if you were, a, if, if you were a new life coach, okay? So you come to Tim's story and, and I say, okay, what's your background? You say, well, I went to USC and I have a psychology degree. And I go, oh, that's, that's good. So you, we could use that in your curriculum. So first you have to form a, a curriculum. So you, you create your own curriculum, maybe borrow from others, uh, but make sure you let people know you're borrowing from, from other people. So I say to you, um, do you have any clients? No. All right, so let's advertise free life coaching, but we're only gonna do this for three months. Okay. Okay, so let's take on like eight clients a week for absolutely free. Keep your day job. Don't just go full-time coaching. Keep your day job, it's very smart. Coach for free. Then you say to these people you're coaching for free, if this has been beneficial to you, I'm now starting to charge to coach. This is my fee. I guarantee you, because I know this, because I do this, many of the people, not all, but many of the people are gonna stay on with you because now you've hooked them because you're good at what you do. So one way is now I'm a paid service, okay? I've been doing this just because I'm growing in this, but I'm adding value to your life. So now we're charging. The second thing is, if I've added value to your life, can you think of two people that you can tell about my services? So I'm gonna send you a text or an email that you could forward. That's how people start building, okay? It's very similar to speakers. I say this to speakers. If you go speak at a seminar, and the people like you, like let's say if you go speak for Nike and the guy at Nike goes, oh my God, you're the best I've ever had. Okay, since you think I'm the best, you have a lot of friends in the space of leadership. If you could think of two friends, if you could send my information, that would really help. That's another way to market and get your brand out there. I love it. For, for structure, how often do you think somebody needs to be life coached? Yes. Is that a weekly thing, a monthly well, thing? Well, here's the deal. So one of the popular things is bundles. Mm -hmm. So, and I do believe in bundles, but you got to make sure you have a curriculum that people want to buy a bundle of that curriculum. Right. So I'm not a one-off life coach. So we have bundles 
of like five coaching sessions with Tim Story. But you have to understand, I have 60 different lessons that I've created with three psychologists, remember, and one psychiatrist. So I got 60 different lessons and they're fantastic that you got to fill out paperwork and everything. So I'm, I'm taking you somewhere. So that bundle of five, that's just the beginning. Most people then get hooked because by session three or four, I'm already talking to them about session six, seven, and eight and where I'm gonna take you. So some people do one-offs. I like bundles better because bundles is like Harry Potter, the beginning, Harry Potter 2, Harry Potter 3, Harry Potter 27. <laughs> <laughs> so when, you, when you're figuring out uh, pricing. the pricing, but then also, also in thinking about how often somebody needs to come back, so a bundle of five for your client to get the results. You want them to come back because they're getting results, they found value in what you're, you're giving them. What, what is a, a frequency that actually makes sense? Like if somebody's being life coached once a month, is that enough to get results? Depends on the goal. Okay. Okay, so you have different areas of your life, as you know. I'm just gonna tell you what you know. Physical, mental, spiritual, social life. You have a social life. You have a job, okay? You have a family. So there's, there's different areas of your life. So I might be really coaching somebody in the job part of his life. This is a lot of what I do. But then somebody's daughter may act up. So I've gone from the job to the daughter and the job. And then their health may act up. So I've gone from the job to the daughter and the health. You see that? Mm -hmm. So that's what usually happens to me is that while I'm coaching a client, other areas of their life will begin to have a need, and now I'm coaching from one area to all seven areas of their life. And they need to increase their frequency to get the Not results? Not necessarily. Some people I coach every week, some people I coach every other week, but I, I find that the every other week for the people that really need help, that that's, that's a good uh, time frame. I don't like it to be like once a month because there's a lot that can happen in 30 days. So. Most people that I coach, I coach once a week or every other week and I keep them on track. Got it. For people who then are thinking of raising their prices, who've gotten some results for their clients, they have a steady roster, maybe they're charging 100 bucks an hour and they want to go to two. Are you Kohl's, are you Target, are you Walmart? You got to be realistic about the value that you're bringing. If you, if you feel like you're a boutique and you are like walking into a great store, and Beverly Hills and Rodeo Drive and it's a Dolce & Gabbana. If you're Dolce & Gabbana, then raise your prices. But you gotta, you gotta be realistic. So when I first started with those NFL guys, they were trying to give me a lot of money. I wouldn't take it all hmm. because I wasn't Dolce & Gabbana. This is good, right? And, and was it the mindset that you weren't there or you just didn't have the skills I didn't have, I didn't, I didn't have the, I didn't have the mindset, I didn't have the curriculum and I did not have the experience. Today, I'm dropping all three. Dropping bombs. Yeah, come it. on, man. But, but come on. I've been at it a long time. Yeah. So it's, it's like somebody who can cook. You know, somebody can really cook, and they, they go in a kitchen. They can go in almost any kitchen and make something happen. This is what I do. I can do it in the back of a rap concert. I could do it at an NBA game. I could talk, talk somebody out of doing something crazy. I can do it in a prison. I do I do this in every setting you can imagine because I've been doing it so long and I have that skill set. So I think just be honest about your skill set and your experience and then look at what other people are charging. And then also again, remember we talked about motives? Just make sure your motives are right. Mm -hmm. Make sure your motives are right. Charge because you feel like your service is that valuable and that you want somebody to appreciate your value. I don't have a problem with that. What about the people who actually should be charging more, but they're afraid of getting rejected. They're afraid that their clients may not be able to afford it. They're, they're talking themselves down, but they actually have the ability to do it. Well, some people do it 
in the air for the reason of humanitarian efforts and they're 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 counseling and helping people for humanitarian reasons or spiritual reasons or religious reasons right so that's fine but if if it is your way of making a living that if your friends and your partners are saying hey what you do is valuable so like with you with what you know about youtube and everything you're doing how many followers roughly getting close to two that's two a, million uh, about two million that, that's a lot okay so to spend an hour with you if i'm just a client i, I better i better have a big stack and then you go bam <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, I'm taking your stack. Yeah, then you can get a, <laughs> then you can get a grill. You can get, you get a diamond grill. <laughs> yeah, no, no. I have people. I have people that show up to me with like a sack of money, and sometimes I take it if they have a if they have more sacks. <laughs> right. It depends on the person. And how do you know when to still give back? And you do a lot of work for free, still. So much of my stuff is for free. I'm a humanitarian. I'm in third world nations all the time, speaking in schools, orphanages for free, because I love it. All the stuff we're doing with the prisoners, you know, I'm involved with the prison system, helping with a bunch of people with a great group called ARC ARC. The stuff I'm doing from Melrose Recovery, which we're helping addicts, I'm doing for free. Come on, man, got to give back. What a privilege. What a privilege to like have this information to give back, right? Sure. And so, so making that decision for the person who wants to give back and be humanitarian because they had, they had the right motives, but they're also afraid to charge more and they need it to be able to build a business and hire a team and scale. Yeah. That dilemma of, I know I'm worth it, but I feel like I should be charging more. Yeah. So in that case, I would say if people are paying and they think you're Dolce & Gabbana or Prada, Gucci, Christian Louboutin, take the money. And then take a portion of it and give it away. And could the portion of the money also be like portion of your time? 100%. So it's a portion of the money or the portion of the time. So if, if you're that great and people want to give it, take the money, right? And then you can use a lot of that for charity. That's what a lot of, I won't, I won't name drop my buddies right now, but a lot of great coaches that I know and you know, they give a lot of money away. Robin Hood. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm blessed to be a blessing. I'm glad that I'm blessed. I am blessed, you're blessed. I'm blessed to be a blessing. That's where I'm coming from. Love it. This is our last episode with Tim's story on how to build a successful life coaching business. Today, episode 10, talking about balance. What do you got for us? Is it possible to have balance? I'm asking you. Oh man, you're the life coach. Yes, it's possible to have balance. <laughs> I don't want to upset Tim's story. My gosh, you could have balance. <laughs> okay, so we've talked about it a little bit before. You have your physical life, your spiritual life, your mental, which is like your clarity. Mm -hmm. You have your family. You have your financial, your job. Okay, but what's very, very, very important is that we have balance in all this. Some people say you can't have balanced success. I believe you can. I don't believe that you should be like super successful in your job and your body's falling apart. Hmm. Or your body is like rock solid and you have no clarity of mind. So I'm, I'm all about balance. I actually take days off. I actually go on vacation and I'm not on my phone all the time. And see a lot of the guys I coach are like big crybabies. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Because when you coach the mighty, they think they need you right now and you better answer right now. Mm. So I was recently just in Spain, okay? So I'm enjoying myself and I was laughing because I was getting all these texts from powerful people and they were like, Tim, please, I know you're on vacation, just two minutes, but it's not even something that important. If somebody was like, you know, in dire straits, no, this is like, questions about little business moves they're doing. They're just spoiled. Mm. So no matter how spoiled they are, I do not answer everybody's urgent because I believe in balance. I believe in slowing down to the rhythm of life. And how much of balance is personal? Like Tim Story's version of balance will be different than somebody else's. How much of a variance do you think there is? So a lot of it is what's your priority? So 
my priority is I want to live life. So I believe that God gave you and me a gift of life. Mm -hmm. The Greek word for life is Zoe, as you know, which is a God kind of life with a skip in your step and a glide in your stride. Little Timmy's story with my big Afro as a kid, I was alive. Me in my mid fifties, look at me, I'm still alive. I am alive. I, I can still dance. I sing, even though I'm not a good singer. Are you with me? <laughs> I'll do karaoke on occasion. I love movies. I love documentaries. I like cracking up with my friend's kids. I am so, I'm, I'm as alive as I was when I was 10 years of age. Hmm. So I choose life. So that is my priority, to live. My priority is not just success, you know, getting to the next place. I'm living. Out of my living, I am successful. Out of my living, I am prosperous. Out of my living, I'm a good father, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what's the process for you of helping somebody find what balance looks like to them? Because I think there's a tendency to look at somebody's life on Instagram or on YouTube and they see one side and you want that from this person and, and then you judge yourself against what time they wake up. Yeah. And like, well, they're waking up at four and then hustling and grinding at work. So I should do that too, even though it may not be the best fit for you. Yeah. And then you feel insecure that you're not able to keep up with that person and that thing and this person and this thing. And, and then just you feel worse about yourself. I think a lot of it is, is a personality type. Okay. Okay. So I am an artist. Okay. So I can actually write songs. I can draw, I can paint, I design jewelry. I play around with designing clothes. I write plays, I write movies, I create TV shows. So I'm an artist. All my speeches I create myself. So many Tim Storyism one-liners, I created them all. And so I'm an artist. So I'm not the guy that is in, uh, you know, on, on purpose gonna say, I'm gonna beat the sun up. I, I don't have like that military background of, I'm gonna beat the sun up. Right. The reason I wake up at five in the morning is just, that's the time I wake up. So since I'm up, then I meditate, I pray, I study, okay? Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. I fill my spirit, okay? I get ready and I go to the gym. So I'm in, I'm in the gym at about 6.15. I'm in there from 6.15 to about 7.30. I shower and I'm already coaching at about 8.30. So I'm already flowing. So if that's on my grind, so that's on my artistic grind. <laughs> and do you keep that up when you're traveling? You're about to head off to play some golf, Palm Springs. Yes, I will wake I will wake up early on accident and I will do similar things. So the, the reason that I exercise about six days a week is because I used to wake up, I'd feel depressed. And is as much energy as I have, I was talking to Smokey Robinson about this, because Smokey's like my brother. And then, and he says he says, Man, Tim, this used to happen to me. Because you go from the high of performing to all of a sudden this down, you come down. Hmm. Does that make sense to yeah, you? Yeah, 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 for sure. So I'd wake up and I'm Mr. Optimistic. I wake up depressed. And he goes, Tim, the thing that helped me is, man, you gotta exercise. Hmm. So I I hit that treadmill. I exercise six out of seven days, and it, it just it just makes me feel so much better. And it's cardio over I do over. I do, well I do I I have a trainer and I do I do free weights. And, but I do lighter weights just to stay toned. And then I, um, I do a lot of cardio, but that really helps my headspace. Yeah. If you look at most of America, I don't think most people would self-identify of living a balanced life. Yes. I'm in a balance. And you know, I may, I may have to turn down sometimes thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to like go to my son's baseball game when he was smaller or go to my daughter's ballet uh, performance, whatever. How much of that is scheduling and just knowing, hey, I need to I need to spend this amount of time or I need to make sure I'm at that baseball game or I need to make sure that I'm spending time morning doing my, my prayer versus 
feeling, you know what, like I'm feeling a little overwhelmed right now Yeah. in the moment. I need to take an hour to myself and just relax. So it's, it's, it's a little both. Okay. So sometimes um, your body and your mind and your psyche is telling you you need to rest. And sometimes it's just the discipline of it. Okay. Like for instance, I intentionally, I live by my mother. My mother is 87 years of age. So she raised me. When my father died when I was 10, she had to raise, you know, all her kids, five children, uh, working at a donut shop. So, um, you know, my older sister, she was married. So she had four at home, but you know, she had five kids still to raise. So that's my mother. So I used to always be in Beverly Hills. That's where I lived. That's where I did all my stuff. And I purposely came and rented a house in, in Orange County where you are right the second. And we turned this like into a studio slash office just to be close to my mother. And all my friends go like, whoa, how come you're not just over there? I am over there, but I'm also over here because my mother lives down the street. So that's balance. So I'm around my mother a lot. I'm in my 50s. I hang out with my mother sometimes. It's my mother. That's balance. But, but, you, but you're losing money. That's my mother. So I don't really think I'm losing money. Hmm. So what's, what's, what's important? Do donuts mean anything to you now? Huh? Do donuts mean anything to you now? I love donuts still. So, so about once every two weeks, I still sneak into a donut shop. But I'm so good with donuts because I've been around donuts since I was a child because she ran donut shops. I could take a bite of it and I could tell how good the, the, the baker is mm. and I could I could tell what kind of flour they're using. Wow. That's how good I am with donuts. What, what's your favorite donut? Uh, so I, I love Krispy Kreme. Wow. I, because they, they just do them right. Just the original. The original. They got them down. And when the hot sign is on, I may make a U-turn and go there. <laughs> but I believe in balance. I believe in balance. Balance has made me good at what I do. So it's a funny thing. I was going to speak at this big conference and I was behind the scenes and I was playing with this guy's kids and his kids were joking with me because I'd known him forever. And the guy that invited me literally came up and he goes, hey, uh, uh, hey Tim Story, uh, 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 are you okay? I go, yeah, what do you mean? He goes, you're gonna be up in like four minutes. And I go, yeah, I'm mic'd. And he, and he goes, are you okay though? I go, oh, yeah, what do you mean? He goes, I've seen you on stage before and you're all hyped up. Don't you need to hype yourself up? I go, no, I'm. don't worry, you'll see. Cause so many speakers, like if they speak to a big crowd, they're like pacing. Oh, right. Have you ever seen that? Yeah. Not me. No, dude, I'm like right here. I'm in the moment, I'm balanced. I'm playing with somebody's kids. I'm high-fiving somebody. I'm answering somebody's question. I'm not uh, cramming for a test. I'm ready. Give me the mic. <laughs> I like that. I'm not cramming for a test. Give me the mic, yo. <laughs> Bam, fire. We set stages on fire. What, what do you think is the most important thing that America should do to get more balance in their life? Uh, part of it is don't take yourself so doggone seriously. I think mm -hmm. that, 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 that so many people they're like on this, they're on this thing like, uh, oh man, I said I gotta do this by this age and uh, I gotta do this by that age. Really? I think it's that thing that I teach on, as you know, the law of the harvest. You gotta plow the ground. Every day I'm hustling. Every day I'm hustling. So I am plowing. Tim Story's plowing. Then I'm planting seed. Then I'm watering seed, which is repetition. And then I'm breaking out harvest. So right now I'm breaking out all these harvests and speaking for all these years. I'm breaking out harvests and life coaching. But now I'm in the Broadway plays. I'm working on a $25 million Broadway play that I helped create with my partner. So, so I'm plowing, 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 learning, 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 learning. Okay? So there's, there's certain things that I'm harvesting, but certain things I'm plowing. But every great farmer still has to rest. So I'm going to rest so I can be a better plower, planter, and harvester. Some people are so exhausted, they don't even know how to get their harvest. Hmm. You know how powerful that is? It's powerful stuff. Even LeBron James takes time off in games. LeBron James 
his coach is resting him so he's at an optimum level at certain times in the game. I got to rest so I can be Tim Story. Hmm. Yeah. What do you recommend for somebody who's doing this part time? They got a family, they got a job, they're coming home, they're now still trying to build their business, but they're feeling pulled in multiple directions and they're not as They're not going to like this answer. Okay. You ready? I'm ready. But this is why I'm good at what I do. Let's hear it. Okay, so if you wanted to do it all in 12 months, let's do it in 18 months. I want to I want to give you 6 months of grace. If you want to do it in 2 years, let's do it in 2 and a half years. As soon as I say that to people, all of a sudden, all this, you could just see them like, ooh. I'm like, what's, what, what's, what are we chasing? Like, like I, I watch people on freeways sometimes where they're like just cutting people. I'm like, is he rushing home to lay down on his couch? <laughs> are you, you get my point? Yeah. Are, 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 are you rushing home to get home to your nagging husband? Like, slow down, man. Listen to some cool music and just chill. So, I mean, I'm doing a lot. You know, I got all this stuff going on. But there's a time and place for everything. So sometimes I'm like, vroom, 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 sixth gear of a Porsche. Sometimes I'm cruising in third gear. So right now, me and you are just cruising, dropping wisdom, changing lives, mm -hmm. watching you go to almost two million, then you're going to be three million and four million and still hopefully be my buddy. So we're, we're living balanced life. Living a balanced life is awesome. I love life, man. I love life. I'm into life. Life is good. Cool, man. Appreciate the feedback. It, it's a different perspective than what most people are preaching. So I love you sharing the wisdom. Thank you very much. Cool. 10 episodes down, man. People want to dive deeper into your world. Where do you want them to go? Uh, TimStory.com. But I'm S-T-O-R-E-Y. So Tim and then S-T-O-R-E-Y. And people can life coach with me. And there is a line, but it's worth the wait. Don't you think some things are worth the wait? Some things are. Yeah. And you got your app? So we got an app called the Utmost app that they can get right now on iTunes. So they can download it. So Life Coaching with Tim Story. Then we got an app. And then also my Instagram is Tim Story Official. Love it. We'll link all of that down in the description below. Tim Story. Thank you for the love, man. Life is good. To learn how to build a million dollar restaurant business, check the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe, and I'll see you there. 90% of restaurants in New York never see an anniversary. Wow. Some percentage of them never open their doors. Wow. And it's a, uh, if I'm off, I'm off slightly. It's a right. horrific number.